Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to build a gazebo, you know, a garden structure. Sometimes they were called summer houses. I've seen them screened in and completely open. I've seen them built very small and sometimes really big, mostly in the form of an octagon. I'll show you where we got the idea for ours next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. Once again, we return to the Concord Museum. You may recall that they have a wonderful collection of artifacts from the colonial period. Today, we're here to see their classic Victorian-style gazebo, which is situated at the corner of the lawn next to the road. Turns out that this was built by an old friend of ours, Jack Rogers, several years ago. Let's look at some of the features. It's supported by some stones. It's close to the ground. And the decking is a southern yellow pine laid in the eight segments of the octagon. The posts lead up to some collar ties, which keep the gazebo from spreading apart. On top of the collar ties, there are curved rafters, which are a lamination of wood strips. And on top of that, there's some four inch wide roof sheathing. What I really like about this gazebo is the way that the roof sweeps up to that wooden finial at the top. Now Jack covered the roof with red cedar shingles and then he capped all the ridges with red cedar shingles. Each opening has a nice decorative element and there's a simple railing to close it in. Now this is a little large for where we'd like to place our gazebo but there are plenty of ideas here. I found a place for our gazebo in the woods out behind the shop where I had a clearing that was about 10 feet in diameter. It's going to be a great place to come out to on a summer evening because we're going to screen ours in. In fact, there's going to be a screen door right here leading out through the garden. The first thing I did was the layout. I set a series of strings. First this one, then using a framing square 90 degrees for this one. Then I bisected each angle. The result are strings that are 45 degrees to each other. Then I measured from a center stake and put a little mark on the line, which defines the outer point of the frame, so that I could set these solid concrete blocks. I removed the bark mulch and just made sure that the soil underneath was compacted. Then I leveled each block to one another. Now, if you'd like to build one of these gazebos, a measured drawing is available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, to get started, we want to set the perimeter of the floor frame. These pieces are two by six. Now, each piece is three foot, six and five eighths inches long on the outside, and cut at a 22 and a half degree angle. And I'll fasten them with some screws. Now you'll notice that I'm using 2x6 pressure treated lumber for the floor frame, which means it should last for many years. The gazebo that we looked at earlier had the floor decking system installed in segments, triangles. And the problem with that is, is that there are a lot of joints along each edge. And in time, the boards will curl making it difficult to slide the furniture around, and you could even trip on them. So I've designed a much simpler floor system. My joists will run in this direction, 16 inches on center. The flooring will run perpendicular, giving me fewer joints. Well, now I'm ready to check for squareness. I want to measure from that corner to this corner. Nine foot three and a half. And then I want to check the opposite diagonal. Nine foot three and three eighths. So I want to bring it this way just a little bit. Seven sixteenths. Good. Well, now a word about power tool safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. 
And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. I cut the ends of these joists at 45 degrees to fit the perimeter. Now for the post. There are eight of them, and they go at the intersections of the perimeter. They have all kinds of notches and bevels to fit the floor frame and the roof. I made them in the shop. For the post, I bought pressure-treated 4x6s. And the first thing I want to do is bevel the narrow edges. To do that, I'm going to use my 12-inch radial arm saw, which allows me to make it in one pass. Otherwise, I'd have to use my table saw and set it up for two passes. Now the joiner does a nice job smoothing up the edges from the saw cut. Now to the radial arm to make the notches. I've installed my stacked dado head cutter in the radial arm and I've screwed two wedges to the table. And they're actually made from scraps that were cut off the post. This way the post is positioned so that the notch will be 90 degrees to the side. The last notch to make on each post is up at the top. It's an inch and a half wide and it'll receive the collar ties. Now I can't cut that with the dado head cutter, so I'm going to use a circular saw, make a series of passes through, and then chisel out the rest. My collar ties are two by fours, and I've laid out a notch that I need, one on each end, where they fit over the tops of the post. Now this notch and one like it in another collar tie will give me a half lap joint where they intersect. The collar tie extends beyond the post and each end is cut at an angle to receive some trim. So I've tipped my radial arm saw to 22 and a half degrees and swung the arm around to 33 degrees. Now I'm going to swing the radial arm to 33 degrees on the other side of zero and finish the cut. To secure the post to the frame, I'm using two carriage bolts, one on each side of the joint. Now with all the posts installed, it's time to put in some blocking and fillers to catch all the decking. Now the 2x4s that wrap the top are the same length as the 2x6s that wrap the perimeter of the floor. And the angle on the end is 22 and a half degrees.
Okay, now it's time for the collar ties. And that'll really tie the top together and make it nice and stiff. Okay. Now the remaining collar ties, which have to be cut where they intersect in the middle, I'm cutting right out here on the job site with my sliding compound miter box. All right, well, that should do it. Now let's get started putting on the decking. Now, using my circular saw and my jigsaw, I'm able to notch these pieces of five quarter by six decking so that they fit in between the post. Now I want to cut the end at 22 and a half degrees where it meets the adjacent piece. To secure the decking, I'm using eight penny stainless steel ring shank nails. They won't stain the wood or rust. Now for the field, I'm using more of the five quarter by six decking, carefully fitting it between the perimeter. Now I started at the center, and I'm gonna work my way to each edge. I will butt them up tightly because they'll shrink a little bit. It's gonna take a little while. And by the looks of the amount of light I got left, I won't be able to finish it tonight. Ah, there you are. Since I saw you last, I completed laying the field of the deck, carefully fitting the boards around the post and the perimeter pieces. Then I lay down a piece of plywood to protect the floor while I continue building the gazebo. This 2x4 post is temporary. It'll help support the ceiling joist, which I'm going to use as a scaffolding to frame the roof. I also took some time to put some braces and springboards to hold all the posts plumb while I frame the roof. Now I've already installed four of the roof rafters and you start to see the shape. It's going to be kind of neat. The rafters are actually made up of two pieces of three-quarter inch plywood laminated together. They have a slight curve that leads up to a king post. Both elements I made back at the shop. I start out forming the rafters by laying them out on some three-quarter inch plywood. Then I rough cut them with the jigsaw. With them fastened together in pairs, I'll perfect the cut at the bandsaw. Now I'm going to secure the pieces together using some construction adhesive. Next, I want to secure the pieces together with some inch and a quarter galvanized screws. Altogether, we'll need eight of these. The next element of the roof framing system is the king post. It's the piece that goes at the top where all the rafters meet. I start out with a piece of stock about ten and a half inches long and five and an eighth inches square. I'm knocking off the corners at a 45 degree angle so that I get eight equal sides.
And that's how those elements were made. Now, when it comes to fastening the rafters to the top of the collar tie, there's no effective way to get nails in there. So I'm going to use these half-inch plywood gussets, which bridge between the collar tie and the rafter. And I do that on both sides of each rafter. Now where the rafters meet the king post, I'm toenailing them in with some eight penny stainless steel nails. With four opposing rafters installed, I'll infill with the remaining four. Here I've applied some rough four inch spruce boards on the roof, leaving a three quarter inch space between them. This is known as skip sheathing and it'll allow the wood shingles that I'm going to put on next to breathe. Now this cleat right here along the rafter will just give me a guide to mark where I want to cut the boards off at the center of each rafter. Now I've set my saw at about a 15 degree angle. Now this is where a compound miter box comes in handy. I'm taking boards and making an 18 degree cut across the face and back cutting it at 15 degrees so that it'll fit up against the cut that I made with the circular saw. I've left them a little long. I'll go up the roof, trim it, and then repeat the process all the way around. Thirty-five and a half. Each course gets shorter by three inches. How's it look? Maybe tomorrow we can start shingling it. Of course, before I can apply any roof shingles, I have to do the trim around the eave. And it's made up of two pieces. The first piece I want to install is the soffit, which I just trimmed. The front edge of the soffit is beveled at 30 degrees, and it's cut across the face at 22 and a half degrees. The boards sit underneath the extensions of the collar ties and get nailed in place with some six penny stainless steel nails. The next board to apply is the fascia board. It's a piece of one by eight that I've ripped down to six and a quarter inches. The tricky cut to make is where the boards meet at the corner, but it's easy at the compound miter box. There are two angle settings I have to make at the miter box. First, the bevel, which is gonna be a little over 20 degrees, and then the cut across the face, which is gonna be a little over 11 and a half degrees. Okay, now the length of this piece has to be measured across the top edge, long point to long point, and it's about 50 and a half inches. Let's try it. I'd say that's just about perfect. Well, like the gazebo that we saw earlier, I am going to use red cedar shingles on the roof. You may recall that the hips of that gazebo were capped with shingles, and that's okay on a large roof, but because our gazebo is smaller, I'm afraid that that cap will overpower the scale of the roof. So I'm just gonna weave or braid the corners, and that's a job that takes patience. I got started by installing these temporary 
half inch pieces of plywood on the fascia boards and that will act as a guide for the overhang of the shingles. First thing I want to do is slide a shingle over to the corner and put a pencil mark along the hip and trim it. Now that's a little stronger than I'm going to need. I'll plane it to fit. Here's where the cleat comes in. Holding the shingle flush to the cleat, I'll install a couple nails. Now, using a block plane, I want to trim the shingle so that it's flush to this roof surface. Okay, that's good. Now we'll repeat the operation coming from this roof plane. Onto the cleat and two more nails. Okay, now you can see where the patience comes in. You can't rush this job. Now this is the easy part, infilling between the two hips. As long as I remember to leave about an eighth to a quarter of an inch gap to allow for the expansion of the shingles. Now I have to repeat the process again, going over this course, being sure to stagger the joints. Now to double up the starter course. I start at the hip, doubling the shingle that I put on the hip last. Now to make it look right and be sure that no water runs under the shingles, I want to slide this course down an additional eighth of an inch. Now here's the seam of the starter course and here's the bevel. Now I want to plane this shingle flush to this roof plane. Okay, now we'll cover this with a shingle. Okay, now if you look up at the edge of this joint, you can see why it's waterproof. Okay, with that little tip removed, you can see here's the top joint. So if any water gets in there, it's going to land on the shingle beneath and run out because the closest joint is way over here about an inch away. Okay, now that's the first course that's going to show. 17 or 18 courses more to go times 8 means I have 144 more of these braids to go. And that's going to take some time. A couple of days, I think. Now next time, we'll finish the trim out here, build some screens, railings, and decoration. So until then, I'm Norm Abram, shingling away here at the New Yankee Workshop. Production of WGBH, Boston.